In this video, we're going to cover the Nidarians. So in the last video, we talked about the coanoflagellates as being the group from which um, animals are derived, the uh, protozoan group from which animals are derived. And we talked about our first animal group, the peripherans, the sponges, which are really simple animals. We're going to talk about a much more diverse, at least morphologically, group and a more complex anatomically group, the Nidarians, this video. So there are over 13,000 described species of Nidarians. Some of the ones that you're probably more familiar with are the sea anemones and corals of coral reefs, hydra, which you're likely to see in lab, and anything that is generally referred to as a jellyfish um, is a Nidarian. Now most of these are marine, but there are a few in fresh water. And here's a, a look at some of the diversity that we're going to be covering. There are two main clades within the Nidarians, the Anthozoans and the Medusazoa. Okay, so the Anthozoa is the earliest branch coming off of uh, the phylogeny that is the Nidarians. And the more diverse group, at least morphological diversity, is the Medusazoa. And we'll talk about some of the specific groups within this. Now the Anthozoans are uh, the earliest group and they have not evolved at this point a polyploid body form. We'll talk about how um, most Nidarians have both a polyp and a medusa stage. Now the medusazoans, again more morphologically diverse, do have both a polyp and a medusa stage. The medusa stage uh, dominates in some of these groups in fact. So the scyphozoans and the cubozoans, if you see one of these animals in one of these groups, you're more likely to see it in the medusa phase. So what are these phases? So the medusa phase is what you would refer to typically as the jellyfish phase. It um, is free swimming or floating typically, as opposed to the polyp phase, which typically is sessile or very slow moving at best. But really they're very similar as far as their structures go. I mean, imagine you take the polyp form here, squinch it down a little bit and turn it upside down, you're, you're really uh, talking about a medusa type at that point. But again, the polyp form is all that you're going to see in an anthozoan, um, but then you see a transition in life phases between medusa and polyp forms in uh, the medusazoan representatives. So examples of uh, anthozoans, the name actually refers to uh, flower animals. So this refers to things like the sea anemones and the hard corals that make up coral reefs, um, sea fans, sea pins. And if you look at a coral, really it's very similar. Each individual zooid, living individual, is really similar to like a small anemone. But they secrete these calcareous um, cups around them which form the coral reefs. Interestingly though, these are actually connected through their gastrovascular cavity to polyps, uh, other uh, polyp individuals in the colony. Some examples of medusazoans, the scyphozoa is a clade within this group, a subclade. This is, represents most of what you would see as the large jellyfish species. So if you see a large jellyfish washed up on a beach, most likely it's a scyphozoan. Here's one that washed up on a beach when I was doing some field work in Taiwan. One of the ways that you can identify a scyphozoan is these indentations in the margin of the bell, kind of this scalloping associated with that. And, and if you look at the um, indentation itself, there are these two little um, fleshy-like structures called lappets that surround this area of sensory structures called a ropallium that we'll talk about in a little bit. So that, that's one of the ways that you can tell a scyphozoan. The other is look at the size of these uh, oral arms, very large oral arms surrounding the mouth. Cubozoans are also in the medusazoa clade. The common name for these are sea wasps. These are marine and these medusa are very differently shaped compared to most jellyfish. So it's more kind of a cube and that provides a little bit more hydrodynamic capability. So these actually are fairly good swimmers. And the tentacles in this case are just coming off the corners of each of the cube. And if you look on the inside, they have this uh, tissue that, you can see it a little bit better here, constricts the opening 
going into the bell. This is called a valerium, and this allows a, a more focused jet propulsion for more efficient swimming. These are big time fish feeders, and so they're going after larger prey, and to do that, they have very uh, toxic toxins to vertebrates in their tentacles, which unfortunately can be very toxic to humans as well. And so uh, people that are stung by cubozoans, it's incredibly painful and in some cases can be fatal within 20 minutes. The hydrozoans are also examples of medusazoans. They typically go through both life cycles, the uh, medusa phase and the, the polyp phase. Usually the medusa phase in this situation is relatively small, so relatively small jellyfish in hydrozoans. And the dominant form in this case is the polyp form. Now one of the ways besides size that you can tell the difference between a hydrozoan medusa and some of the others is they have this internal projection kind of like in the box jellies, but they have a rounded bell. In this case it's not called a valerium, it's called the velum. But it serves the same function, this internal projection that helps to focus um, the uh, jet propulsion so that it gives them a little bit more swimming capabilities. But they're not nearly as efficient as the box jellies as far as their speed and directional movement. As far as tissue complexity, cnidarians are diploblastic, so they have an ectoderm, which is generally referred to as the epidermis, and an endoderm, which makes up the gastrodermis. In between that, they don't have mesoderm. Instead, they have this uh, extracellular jelly matrix, kind of like what we saw in the mesohyle of sponges. In this case, it's called mesoglia or mesenchyme. And there is no body cavity, no seal. Most of them show radial symmetry. Some technically are biradial in symmetry. They have an oral end where the mouth is, and the opposite end of that is the aboral end. If you put ab in front of a, a word, it means it's the opposite of that. So the opposite of the oral end is the aboral end. And there is no clear head in cnidarians, and so they don't show cephalization. So talk about the support and skeletal system. The medusa, and in some polyp forms, it is primarily just hydrostatic pressure, so water pressure and support fibers that are in this uh, gel-like mesoglia. In other polyp forms, there is a, a external, relatively thin and flexible support structure called the parasarc. So the parasarc is kind of like this clear uh, outside covering it's composed of proteins and a polysaccharide called chitin. Chitin is a, a very prominent polysaccharide seen in a lot of animals. The soft corals have an internal support structure that sometimes is a kind of a horny fibrous material and other times it's more calcareous, uh, calcium carbonate support structure. And this rod um, can be relatively uh, continuous in the case of the, the uh, fibrous ones, um, but it can actually be created by these fused calcareous individual little components called sclerites in other organisms. So the C pins that you see here, C fans um, seen here, and C whips have these internal types of support. Now the hard corals uh, obviously have a very hard and very rigid dense calcium carbonate endoskeleton and the, the animal actually grows epidermis uh, overlaying this, and then they secrete this skeleton internally. The individuals that are living in these colonies can uh, actually form uh, new individuals on top of the uh, former generations of, of corals, and so that's how you build up these massive coral reefs. The muscular system is fairly simple, in cnidarians, but it's more complex than just the contractile cells that we saw in some of the sponges. We actually do have muscle cells here, but the muscle cells in most animals are produced by mesoderm. We don't have mesoderm here, so the muscle cells here derive from epidermis in one case and gastrodermis in other cases. And here we see some uh, epithelial muscular cells, those derived from the uh, epidermis, and you see that they have these extensions coming off in parallel sheets. These are sheets of myofibrils uh, and they make these nice long contractile sheets that allow a longitudinal and in some cases uh, circular muscle contractions. In addition to a relatively simple but they do have a muscular system, we have a nervous system. 
but it's a relatively simple system. It's what we refer to as a nerve net system. So it's a series of interconnected neurons without any centralized control. So there is no brain or ganglia. There's an interesting difference in the nerves in Cnidarians. They are what we saw call nonpolar, meaning that the nerve impulse can travel in both directions. Now in other animals, the signal only travels in one direction. So that is something that's a little different in the Cnidarians com compared to other animals. Cnidarians have two of these nerve networks that are interconnected. Um, one of these networks is between the mesenchyme and the gastrodermis. So here we see the, the mesoglia, or the mesenchyme here. And on the inside of that, we have the gastrodermis. And you see that there are interconnected neurons here. That's one of these systems. Then on the other side of the mesoglia, you have the epidermis and an additional set of neurons. But there is some connection, as you can see, um, between these two nerve networks. So this allows them to be able to communicate and coordinate movement and muscular contractions. The sensory structures vary uh, between polyp and musiforms. In polyps, it's primarily mechanosensory uh, structures that are really concentrated on the tentacles. And so we'll see that the tentacles have these nidocytes with nematocysts in them, these stinging cells, and those are triggered primarily by a touch and sometimes some, some chemical um, triggers. But um, that's the, the primary mechanism of sensing, mechanosensory sensing in polyps. Medusa uh, tend to have a concentration of neurons in this ring around the margins of the bell. And that's, so the margins of the bell are the outside edges here. And um, this allows for coordinated contraction of the bell for swimming locomotion. But then there are also concentrations of sensory structures at these little indentations, in this case of this scyphozoan here. And these fit under two basic categories. There are statocysts, which are mechanoreceptors. These uh, are little calcareous statoliths, or like little rocks, that uh, depending on the direction of gravity, they place pressure on sensory cilia. And this helps the animal understand the direction of gravity, or if it's moving in one direction, what that direction is. They also have in these concentrated areas, ocelli or photoreceptors. And some of these are just simple concentrated pigments of cells that allow phototropism. And phototropism is just the ability to move relative to where you sense light. So positive phototropism as you move toward the light, negative phototropism as you move away from the light. In species with photosynthetic uh, zoanthelae, they want them to be able to photosynthesize so they can use some of those carbohydrates they're producing so they will tend to swim toward the light for that reason. Other species tend to track uh, the movement of zooplankton day and night. The zooplankton tend to go up uh, the surface at night and go down to deeper waters uh, during the day. And so by determining day versus night, these animals are able to track those zooplankton swarms. The concentrated area, again, in those um, areas where you see the ocelli and the statuses is this region called the ropalium. And so you can see here is a ropalium, and they have these uh, lappets, these fleshy-like structures that provide a little bit of protection for uh, these sensory structures. But the statuses, remember, are the mechanosensories, ones measuring gravity and, and movement, and the ocella are uh, sensing light. Cubozoans have much more complex eye structures. Uh, instead of just ocelli that can sense the direction and intensity of light, these guys can actually see. They have a lens and retina so that they can see an image. And remember, these are the ones that are, that are more active swimming, uh, going after large fish, so very active predators, and it makes sense that they would need to have a better understanding, a visual understanding of their environment. Now, as far as movement, this is a big difference between sponges. So this is our first group of animals that is really showing capabilities of moving. Now, the polyps themselves typically, as I mentioned, are sessile and only show limited movement. They can kind of glide on their basal disc uh, for a limited, a very slow movement. Some, like this sea anemone here in the genus Strompia, they actually can, if they're attacked by a very slow-moving predator like a sea star, 
they can sense that and they basically thrash their bodies around by these uh, very quick longitudinal muscle contractions and can swim away from their predators. I mean, I, I put swim in quotes here because it's certainly not a very agile um, way of moving, but it, it is adaptive. Now, some species have very atypical polyps, that they live in these colonies that can generate these gas-filled flotation structures, and um, instead of being sessile, they can float. And in some cases, even these float serve as sails that will allow them to, to move in the direction of the wind. One example of these are the, the Physalia, the Portuguese man of war, floating colonies, in this case, of both polyps and Medusa individuals. So it's not really active moving, but it is um, getting up off of the uh, benthic floor and not being sessile. Now, when we get to Medusa, most of these are pelagic. So they've left their sessile uh, benthic area and they're pelagic moving. Pelagic means that you're in the water column. They can move through coordinated contractions of the myoepithelial sheets uh, at, on their outside. At the margins of the bell can forcefully propel water from that bell interior, so uh, create some jet propulsion. And as I mentioned previously, there are two anatomical features that can increase the efficiency of this jet propulsion, the valerium uh, or the velum. So the valerium is in cubozoans and the velum is in something like this hydrozoan here. But again, it's just an internal ring of tissue that kind of helps focus that propulsive force. The other thing that can affect locomotor efficiency is bell shape, as I mentioned. These really flat bells, uh, medusas associated with most jellyfish, means that they have a lot of drag and they're not going to move very efficiently or very quickly through the water. These cubozoans, it's more of a hydrodynamic uh, shape, and so they are much more efficient swimmers. As far as foraging goes, most cnidarians are capturing food using their tentacles. And these tentacles are lined by cells called cnidocytes. The cnidocytes are cells that contain organelles called nematocysts. And this is a synapomorphy for the group. Only cnidarians have cnidocytes that have nematocysts. At least they're the only ones that create them. We'll talk about one exception to that here in a minute. Now the nematocysts are triggered primarily by mechanical, but in some cases chemical stimulants. And when a nematocyst senses that there is prey nearby or a potential predator that it wants to uh, scare off, uh, it averts these barb-like structures that impale into the flesh of their prey or the, the potential predator and delivers these uh, nasty toxins. And most of these are neurotoxic in effect, meaning that they are affecting the nervous system of uh, whoever they're injecting it into. Now polyp tentacles tend to be more plump and short, uh, surrounding the oral end, and these can actually be contracted into the mouth to deliver food. So sometimes you'll see that with sea anemones, well, they'll, they'll close in on themselves, bringing in food to the mouth. The tentacles of Medusa tend to be much longer and trailing beneath them to increase the chance that they're going to run into something that they can then bring up uh, to the mouth. And we talked about how the, the kind of flattened shape of most of these means they're not very efficient swimmers, but what it does do, this high drag bell shape increases their foraging efficiency because what it does is it creates these swirling vortices on the margins of the bell, which increases the chance that floating food is going to contact those tentacles uh, so that they can more likely capture more food. Once they do get food, the Nigerians have an incomplete uh, digestive tract, so their gastrovascular cavity has a mouth, food goes in and it's digested, and the waste products have to be ejected through the mouth. But notice how extensive this gastrovascular cavity is. So there is extracellular digestion, breaking down the food into its component parts, and then there is simple absorption of those digested foods throughout the body. So in most cases, the gastrovascular cavity is relatively simple, just this uh, fairly extensive but simple chamber that projects throughout the body. But in some cases, they do have these internal projecting septa or walls. And these septa increase the surface area of the gastrovascular cavity and just increase the rate of absorption. So you can see that here in the sea anemone, all of these little invaginations are increasing the, the efficiency of that uh, digestion. Sea anemones can also cycle water in and out so that they can um, kind of wash out their gastrovascular cavity and get rid of 
nitrogenous and food waste. This structure that allows them to do that is a ciliated structure called the siphonoglyph. Well, because they can basically digest their food throughout their body and just absorb it directly into the tissues, they don't really need a circulatory system. So uh, they, they really, there is no circulatory system in cnidarians. Same thing for respiration. They can just exchange gases across their epidermis and gastrodermis surfaces. They're relatively flat animals or thin animals with lots of surface area, so they don't need a respiratory system. Same thing with excretory system. Uh, excretion and regulation of water balance is simply accomplished by diffusion across the epidermis and gastrodermis in these relatively thin, uh, high surface area animals. And they do not have capability of regulating their temperature metabolically, so they're ectothermic. When it comes to reproduction, reproduction varies significantly between the two major subclades. So in the anthozoans, both asexual and sexual reproduction occurs in the polyp form. Because remember, they don't have a medusa form. So they can reproduce asexually through binary fission, budding, fragmentation, and mitotic parthenogenesis. So here you see some examples of, of a sea anemone splitting in two, so budding. Sexual reproduction, uh, most of them are dioecious. So individuals are, are either male or female, and most are oviparous. So they're simply uh, broadcasting their gametes and external fertilization takes place. And when we get into the medusozoa, then we have both a polyp and a medusa stage. And the polyp stage is typically where you see asexual reproduction occurring. Again, binary fission, fragmentation, budding. Um, and that's what you're being, what's being shown here. So here we have a bud that comes off of this individual forming a, a new individual. So this is the asexual cycle. Sometimes the asexual cycle will then produce a medusa, but it's doing that asexually. So the, the medusa, when it's formed, is basically a clone of the polyp that produces it. When that medusa is, however, formed, then it uh, typically goes into sexual reproduction. And uh, most species are dioecious in the situation, so uh, an individual will produce and be a male or female. And the gametes, uh, again, are typically broadcast with external fertilization, and they produce what is called a planula larva. So the planula larva is this uh, small, almost worm-shaped, uh, ciliated larva form that is used for dispersal. In some cases, so in, again, most cases you're just broadcasting your ga gametes. Copulation is rarely seen in some cases, though. Uh, it can be seen, for example, in the cubozoans. And again, remember they have eyes. And it turns out that they even have some courtship displays, kind of some elaborate courtship displays when they're choosing a mate. Now, whether they rely on sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction varies in, in these groups. The medusa stage is, uh, again, relatively large in the scyphozoans, the cubozoans, a prominent part of their life cycle. But remember, in the hydrozoans, it's, it's relatively minor. And so most of the time, they are in the asexual phase of polyp phase, but then they will reproduce sexually with a brief medusa phase. Gametes, when they are released, it's often highly synchronized. And again, we kind of talked about this with the sponges. For the same reason you want to do that, is you want to make sure you're releasing your gametes at the same time as other individuals of your species to increase fertilization efficiency. Oftentimes in corals, this is linked to the lunar cycles in short breeding seasons, so that's uh, the, the mechanism that they use to time reproduction. Other species may reproduce year-round and, and uh, release a smaller batch of gametes, but just more often. Now, Darians produce isolethyl eggs, uh, that undergo holoblastic radial cleavage, and gastrulation does occur in the cnidarians, and it results in the formation of a blastopore that becomes the mouth. And again, as I mentioned, the dispersal phase that is produced in cnidarians is the planula larva, and they vary in their mode of dispersal. Some are benthic and crawl, others are pelagic and float or swim to, to uh, establish away from their parent individual. Like the sponges, the cnidarians oftentimes have really impressive regenerative abilities, and they can separate into individual cells and still grow an entire individual. Individuals also retain stem cells into adulthood, so it allows them to repair or regrow big parts of their body. And so they can basically live indefinitely. 
They also have a variety of defenses like the sponges. They have secondary metabolites to dissuade uh, organisms from attacking or eating them. And again, these also have been found to have pharmaceutical applications. And then I've already mentioned the stinging defenses they have. The nematocysts produce these uh, nasty toxins and it varies in strength. Uh, most scyphozoans have relatively weak toxins. That, that big one that I showed you the picture of with next to my hand, yes, I couldn't help but touch it and see if it could sting me and it didn't, luckily. Some corals, colonial hybrozoans, and I've already talked about the cubozoans, uh, they can produce some really powerful neurotoxins. It can be uh, painful and sometimes even fatal to humans. So the one you're more likely to run across on the Gulf Coast is the Portuguese man war. And there are a variety of ways that you can treat this. Um, some people will add acidic or alkaline solutions to try to reduce, and what this tends to do is it reduces the number of nematocysts that fire, so it prevents the, the pain from really getting uh, intense. But really the, the most, and, and when I say adds uh, acid or alkaline solutions, don't put an acid that's so acidic that it's just going to burn your skin itself. I mean, use some common sense. Same thing for heating pads or submersion in hot water. A friend of mine, she used to work at a marine lab, and she said when they would hear somebody on the beach start screaming, they knew that it was a jellyfish. Uh, attack and so they would just immediately start putting hot water on the stove uh, warming it up and then that person would dip whatever the stung part of the body in this hot water and what that does is it denatures the the proteins that are in the toxins and so it, it ruins their effect again though you don't want to put your hand or your foot in boiling water you you want to put it in as hot a water as you can stand and at first it doesn't seem like that's what you want to do it didn't seem like it would feel good um, but eventually it will denature these proteins. Sea anemones have two forms of defensive tentacles. They have what are called acontia, and these are long tentacles that are actually housed in their gastrovascular cavity that if they're threatened by something can be extruded um, as a defensive ploy. They also have acroragia, which are special defensive tentacles that are around the oral disc. So they're, they're in line with the regular tentacles, but they're basically little sacs of nematocysts. And these are uh, develop in crowded conditions when anemones are trying to fight other anemones for territorial space. And so they'll actually lean into each other, releasing these nematocysts um, as they fight for a space um, to filter feed. And finally, just as a structural defense, the hard endoskeletons of corals also provide some defense against predators because no one's going to try to take a big bite out of coral if that's going to include this crunchy uh, endoskeleton. Uh, at least many organisms are not adapted to do that. Some fish are and some sponges are. Kind of as a side note, so the, these nematocysts are very good at providing defense against most predators. However, there are certain organisms have evolved the ability to eat cnidarians and they chemically prevent the nematocysts from firing. They move them through their own digestive tract and their own tissues and embed them within their own tissues so that they can then use them for their own defense. So here is the case of sea slugs and flatworms and tenophores. So here we have a, a sea slug that has these extensions of its body where it has placed these nidos uh, sacs, which are sacs of nematocysts for their own protection. So it's a really bizarre way of stealing the nematocysts of, of one organism and using it for your own defense. And so this is called kleptonidae behavior. Nidarians range in behavior. Some are solitary, but many of them are colonial. So the corals form these colonies of polyp individuals. The individuals that form each polyp, these are called zooids. And as I mentioned, these zooids, they are a colony of interconnected individuals. They actually share their gastrovascular cavity through a series of these pores, these uh, gastrodermal tubes in the case of this, this species. Sometimes these colonies, polyps can specialize in defense, feeding, or reproduction. And as I mentioned before, some of the Medusa zoans will form highly modified floating colonies of, of either uh, polyp individuals or a combination of polyp and, and uh, Medusa individuals. So this is the Valella, it's referred to the by the wind sailor. This is the one that produces this really nice sail. 
uh, to increase its, its movement, and the Portuguese man-o-war in the genus Physalia. Many Nigerians uh, have some interesting commensal and mutualistic endosymbiotic associations with bacteria and zoanthellae, just like what we saw with the sponges. And, and it's the same kind of interactions that we talked about with the sponges. But then they also show some interesting commensal or mutualistic associations with other animals. So here we have an example of a Nigerian uh, living on the back of crab. And it's just like we saw in the last example of a sponge living on the back of the crab for the same uh, benefits of, of the protection provided by the Nidarian for the crab. But then there's some feeding opportunities that are provided for the Nidarian by the crab. And then probably one of the more famous associations, mutualistic association, is between sea anemones and clownfish. As I mentioned in some species, Medusa will track zooplankton uh, prey up and down the water column, and uh, large populations of jellyfish can have significant impacts on fish populations by uh, consuming a lot of the fish larvae um, or the food, the zooplankton, that the fish larvae would need to survive. And so these can impact uh, fishery production in areas. This is particularly problematic in areas where there are introduced invasive jellyfish species that may not have any natural control, and so they get to really high numbers in these areas, and it can have devastating impacts on the um, aquatic communities there. Now, in other cases, there are some species, uh, as shown here, where the jellyfish actually provide refuge for the young fish. So it's kind of like what we were talking about with the uh, clownfish and the sea anemone. The young fish use this protective structure as a way to hide from potential predators and they have evolved some a resistance to the nematocysts associated with their uh, jellyfish host. But coral reefs really are kind of like the tropical rainforest uh, in the aquatic environment and coral reef formation really is key to establishing um, the diversity in much of the marine communities. When we talk about an organism or a set of organisms, that their presence really sets the stage for the success, the diversity of that area, we call these keystone species. And coral uh, species really are keystone species associated with many coral reef marine communities. If, if they died out, everything that relies on them will also die out. And coral reefs are under attack. Climate change is uh, affecting them in two prominent ways. The increased levels of atmospheric CO2 associated with climate change uh, are causing two really big problems. One, an increased level of dissolved CO2 in ocean waters. What this does is it reduces the water's pH, causing what is called ocean acidification. Now, how this affects the corals is it results in a decrease in the availability of calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is crucial for corals to be able to grow their endoskeleton. And so this has reduced uh, coral reproductive rates and has led to the degradation of reefs and prevented the, uh, the formation of new coral growth. A second thing that climate change is negatively impacting them is the, the literal increase in water temperatures has negative impacts on the zooanthellae. Um, remember, these are oftentimes living in association as endosymbionts with the corals. They either die or they're released by the corals, and it results in what's called coral reef bleaching. Remember, a lot of the colors associated with cnidarians and also sponges is associated with the presence of the zooanthellae. Now, if an area, the temperature fluctuates from high temperature to more appropriate temperatures different times of year, the zoanthelae can come back. They can grow back again, and so this could be a temporary thing. But in other cases, it appears that it's a permanent situation. So in 2017, it was estimated that over 90% of the Great Barrier Reef was impacted by coral reef ble bleaching, and some of this appears, unfortunately, to have been permanent. And when bleaching occurs, the corals are obviously not getting a lot of those photosynthetic products from the zooanthellae mutualists that are living with them. And they're also susceptible by invasion of the sponges. Remember the boring sponges, there's this chemical co-evolution between uh, the fighting of the boring sponges to attack the corals and the corals to defend themselves against the boring sponges. Well, the 
Corals that are in weakened state uh, are more likely to be attacked by these boring uh, sponges. And so this is going to lead to a lot of that breakup of structural integrity of the reef, which is already weakened because of the ocean acidification. Coral reef communities are also threatened by just destructive fishing methods that uh, break up reefs and in some areas increase sedimentation rates because of uh, changes in the terrestrial environment where you have uh, too much water flow uh, coming through a river with too much sediment. It, it leads to cloudy conditions as you see here and the sediments can actually land on the corals which again is going to reduce the photosynthetic capabilities of the endosymbionts like the zoanthellae. So coral reefs are really taking it hard right now for a variety of reasons. So in review, We've talked about the cnidarians. The two main clades are the anthozoans, which only show a polyp form of life, and the medusozoans, which have both a polyp and, as the name implies, medusa body forms. And the medusozoa is more diverse, showing the hydrozoan, scyphozoan, and cubozoan subclades. They're all diploblastic. They show radial symmetry, and as the radial symmetry kind of implies, they don't really have a lot of movement capabilities, not at least really quick movement capabilities, except in the case of the cubozoan, there's the one exception for that. But this is the first group that really does show at least some kind of movement. The two body forms we've talked about are medusa and polyp. Again, that uh, varies from group to group whether you have that or not. They don't have any body cavity. The support is uh, largely hydrostatic or mesoglea in the uh, medusa forms, but there can be some more rigid support structures like a parasarc and various endoskeleton materials uh, seen in some of the uh, polyp forms, in addition to hydrostatic and mesoglea uh, support. This is the first group that does have muscular cells the derived in, in from epidermis or gastrodermis, which makes them a little different from the other animals where, where it's more mesodermally derived, but they do have muscle cells. And they also have a nerve net system. So these two series of, of nerve networks that are interconnected, one through the gastrodermis and one through the epidermis. Um, but there is no cephalization, no head. But we do have important mechanoreceptors um, in the tentacles associated with polyps. And then in medusa, you tend to see um, more diverse neurological sensory systems like the ocella and the statuses. And we do have some movement in this group. So yes, the polyps are pretty much sessile, but at least we have floating or weak swimming capability in these filter-feeding medusa. They, in both stages, will capture food particles in their tentacles, and they subdue these food prey through nematocysts that are produced. So the nematocysts are the organelles in the cells called cnidocytes. And again, this is a synapomorphy for the group, a distinguishing characteristic of the cnidarians. They have an incomplete digestive tract, so they do have extracellular digestion and these very extensive uh, gastrovascular cavities, but there's just a mouth and no anus. But really, they don't have any osmoregulatory, excretory, circulatory, or respiratory systems. There is sexual and asexual reproduction throughout the group, but it varies greatly uh, among the groups and body types, so in the medusa-bearing forms. Um, that's where you see the sexual reproduction and the polyp forms is where you tend to see the asexual um, reproduction, except in the anthozoans, remember in the polyp form, they're doing sexual and asexual. They produce isolethosol eggs with holoblastic radio cleavage and the blastophore forms the mouth. The dispersal phase is the planula larva. And we talked about, like sponges, they have the potential for lots of regeneration and defense, so the long potential lifespans. They do form some social colonies of, of zooid uh, social individuals. Other species live solitary existence. We talked about some of their interesting symbiotic relationships with zooanthellae and other animals. We talked about the importance of uh, many cnidarians as keystone species in their communities, especially coral reef communities. And then we talked about climate change issues that are really uh, challenging um, the ability, particularly of coral reefs, to uh, keep going uh, related to ocean acidification and coral bleaching.